I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's probably where we'll end up and spend most of our time uh, this afternoon, but not going to begin there. But I did uh, want you to be ready and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me remind you of a couple of things. You know, it's very clear in the Old Testament that uh, God is one, but that he manifests himself in at least two persons. In fact, you could even see reference to the Spirit of God in the book of Isaiah. But you also, for example, in the book of Daniel, you see the Ancient of Days, which is the Father, and you see the Son of Man, which we know is Jesus. And so you have a dualism, at least in the Old Testament, of uh, the Godhead. Let me just remind you of something that I've already taught, and that's this. God has a divine family. Okay, we're a human family. God has human beings uh, that he makes a family of. God has a divine family, uh, a heavenly assembly, a council of the Hebrew word is Elohim, which is the plural of God. So it's God's little g. God has a council of Elohim. God has a heavenly assembly. They're called in the scripture by different names. Sometimes they're called the sons of God, small s, the sons of God. God created them. He is the sovereign master over them. The specific name that is applied to God, the God of the Bible in the Old Testament is, we don't know really how it's pronounced, but we pronounce it Yahweh. He's Yahweh, and he is distinct from, and he is superior to all of these Elohim, all of these, this heavenly assembly, this council of gods, if you will. And while he doesn't need them, he uses them to both administrate and to carry out his plans in the heavens. But God has also created a human family. I'm a member of it. You're a member of it. God's created a human family, and originally he, he placed that human family in his earthly abode, the Garden of Eden. And he placed them there to represent him and to administer his affairs and to make the whole earth an Eden. That was his plan. Of course, all of this, creating a divine family, a heavenly family, if you will, and a human family, all of this came with risk because these God imagers were created with a free will and were enabled to choose their own authority over God's authority. And in many cases, that's precisely what they did. Both God's heavenly family and God's human family many of which have chosen their own authority over God's authority. I want to submit to you what is an ancient and biblical worldview that we find in the Torah itself. And I'm going to go back there and I'm going to read it to you in a moment and share some thoughts with you, which I believe is really a summation of all that the Bible says about what God's plan is and what's going on, what went on then in ancient times, what is going on now, and what the future also will shape up and is shaping up toward. But let's pause and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the marvelous truth, the revelation that you give us in what we call our Bible. It's your revelation to us. We wouldn't know these things if you didn't reveal them. We're grateful for them. And we thank you that you have unfolded your plan to us in what we call the New Testament, the new covenant. We pray, Lord, that as we think about these things this afternoon, that 
this will really open our eyes, open our understanding. We know that the enemy would not want us to understand these things and would want them to remain closed to us and and confusing to us. But Lord, I pray that you would break through all of that and that you would give clarity and that you would give uh, great uh, uh, understanding of what the Bible unfolds to us regarding a biblical worldview. We want Jesus to be glorified through it. That's our our ultimate goal. We want your plan to succeed and you to be honored through it. And we just thank you that we can be a part of it and understand it because you've shown us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think perhaps two verses that really succinctly wrap up for us a biblical worldview. What is going on from ancient times to the future? I take you back. I'm going back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verses 8 and 9. And here is what we read. It's the song of Moses. It's Moses' really final words to the new generation of Jewish people that are going to enter into the promised land. Moses is going to die. He's going to go up on the mountain. He's going to be taken, gathered to his people. But he gives them this message, and this is a song that God wanted him to teach the congregation. And in that song, in verses 8 and 9 of Deuteronomy 32, here's what we read. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Let me pause a moment. We'll look at those verses uh, uh, in just a moment. Someone said to me during lunch, you didn't, you talked about persecution, but you didn't say anything about the devil, about Satan. Well, that's because it's not in John 15. There's not a word about Satan in John 15. But we know that Satan is ultimately behind persecution. We understand that because there was a rebellion and Satan sought to overthrow God and to, uh, successfully undermine God's purpose for humanity. He's tried. He continues to try. And I would say that he has hindered God's plan, but he has not stopped God's purpose. But there are three significant rebellions that are suggested in the book of Genesis that Satan is largely behind. And the first one we're probably most familiar with, and that's the rebellion in the Garden of Eden. That's when Satan uh, appears as that uh, Nachash, that serpent, and uh, he deceives the woman. And uh, as a result, they disobey God's one command, both the woman and the man. That's the first rebellion in which he is manipulating humanity, God's human family. The second rebellion is not as familiar. It's the first five verses of Genesis chapter 6. It's where the, the sons of God mingle with the daughters of men. And what is happening there is there are disembodied spirits that of their own free will choose to disobey God's authority and they want to be embodied and they cohabit with human women. And as a result, they spawn a race of giants called the Nephilim. And I believe that that is the basis for the reason of a universal flood uh, that happened after that fact in Noah's day. So those two major rebellions that Satan respond, uh, that spawned rather, were prior to the flood. After their flood, there's one more major rebellion. It's in Genesis chapter 11. 
And this chapter 11 of Genesis is the record of the Tower of Babel. You familiar with that? Where all the nations united and a uh, United Nations, a UN, uh, in order to establish through this unity a, a overthrowing of God's authority. And this really is at the heart of the Bible's worldview. Because at the Tower of Babel, God responded. And we read it. I'm, I'm just going to take a moment and uh, quickly read a couple of verses from Genesis 11. And this is what it says. That uh, they said, let's go build a city and a tower that would reach to heaven. Let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And it says, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. They all have one language. And this they begin to do. And nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go, let us. There again is that uh, phraseology of the plurality, the council of the gods, if you will, let us go down and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And the Lord scattered them abroad from the from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Now, that's usually where we end our thoughts about the rebellion at the Tower of Babel. But actually, God's response to that major rebellion recorded in Genesis 11 is what Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 and 9 is really all about. In fact, when you read those verses, what you should understand is God's response to what happened regarding the nations at the Tower of Babel is really paralleled with what Paul says God's response is to nations, to kingdoms, to societies that uh, forsake God and turn uh, away from God. Romans chapter 1, for example, and verses 18 to uh, 25, it says in those verses that as a result of man not wanting God to be in authority over them, that God turns mankind, God turns humanity, God turns societies over to their own desires. And uh, he gives them a reprobate mind and just lets them do their own thing. And, and he kind of disinherits them, so to speak, and uh, lets them go their own way. Well, what we read in Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9, is really the response of God to the Tower of Babel, and that is that God is simply dispersing the nations, confusing their languages so that they would disperse over the earth, but also included in that is he is disinheriting the nations of the earth. He no longer wants to be in a relationship with the rebellious nations of the earth. Instead, he is handing them over to this heavenly assembly, to the council of the Elohim. These, these uh, disembodied spirits that God created, his heavenly family, that are rebelling against him. He hands them over to them and lets them become the rulers of these nations. And I say that on the basis that, see the, you're not, probably there, but in that eighth verse, it says that God set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. In fact, when Jesus quotes scripture, he most often quotes from the Septuagint rather than what we would call the Masoretic text. And uh, both the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures, and the Dead Sea Scrolls take that phrase, the children of Israel, 
or the sons of Israel, and uh, they translated the, the sons of the gods, which gives it a little bit uh, different meaning. Because when this was written, when, when, when the Tower of Babel took place, the nation of Israel didn't even exist. In fact, in the 10th chapter, you look at the table of nations, there is no Israel. It was not existent at that time. So it really means that when he divided the nations, when he disinherited the nations, he gave them over not to the children of Israel, but he gave them over to the sons of God, so to speak, to this heavenly assembly and put them in, put the nations in their power. He handed them over the nations to the Elohim, if you will, who, when they ruled the nations, ruled them corruptly. And that's exactly what he's referring to in Psalm 82, where we read that God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. That's the Elohim. That's this heavenly assembly. And he says, how long will you judge unjustly and accept persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. Nor uh, They walked on in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said you are gods. He's speaking to this heavenly assembly. I have said that you are Elohim, and all of you are children of the Most High. But, he says, as a result of your rebellion, you will die like men, like mere mortals, and all of your children of the Most High. You'll die like men, and you'll fall like one of the princes. This is God's judgment that he is pronouncing against these corrupt uh, Elohim, if you will, this heavenly council that has corruptly ruled the nations that were disinherited by God and put into their power at Babel. Now, God didn't give up on humanity because what we read happening after chapter 11 is that God decides to begin freshly with a nation that was then not existent. He picks a man called Abram, and through Abram and his seed, a nation Israel comes forth. And from that nation Israel comes a Jewish Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And this is God's plan to both redeem and rescue the nations and the human family as a whole. You follow me? This is a summation of the worldview of the Bible. This is what happened way back in ancient times at, at the Tower of Babel. It's what's happening now, and it's what the book of Revelation uh, brings to a culmination. The nations of the world are being ruled over by evil powers, and you get a little glimpse. The veil gets pulled back once in a while. You see a glimpse of it, for instance, in Daniel chapter 11, where there is a struggle between Michael the archangel and uh, a, a, a being, an evil spirit being called the Prince of Persia. He is uh, a spirit being, not a human being, but a spirit being. And this kind of struggle has been going on since the Tower of Babel, since God disinherited the nations and uh, placed them, dispersed them, and put them in the control of this heavenly council. And he begins fresh with Abram and Israel. Well, we know what happened, right? The nation of Israel weren't successful. Israel failed. They apostatized, and they were exiled by God, which necessitated his plan that he had in place, and that is that out of Israel would come the Messiah. It necessitated Messiah. Messiah really is the true Israel. He's the true uh, vine of God. And so Messiah comes, and uh, yet the Messiah that everyone's looking for is not the one that appears 
in our New Testament when we open the Gospels. The need for Messiah is very clear, but he's not the kind of Messiah everyone's looking for. In fact, let me suggest this, that the Old Testament, that is a revelation to mankind, first to Israel, but to all mankind by God, that the Old Testament, what is called the Tanakh by the Jewish people, that the messianic prophecies, the prophecies of Messiah in the Old Testament that are presented are a puzzling profile that uh, no one in and of themselves is able to discern until after all the pieces are in place. The messianic prophecies in the Old Testament are cryptic. And they are that on purpose. People tell me when they read the Old Testament prophets, I don't understand what they're saying. Well, it takes it takes a renewed mind. It, it takes a spiritual mind, and we'll talk about that in a moment to understand what the prophets are talking about. But we do have a great advantage. We have a New Testament that the Old Testament people didn't have. The complete messianic profile and plan of redemption is deliberately cryptic it's it's uh, scattered it's veiled throughout the old testament in fact the concept of a crucified and resurrected messiah has to be pieced together from different scattered fragments each taken separately do not talk about a crucified risen messiah there is no Old Testament verse about a dying and rising Messiah. You say, what about Isaiah 53? There is no word Messiah in that whole chapter. We know that by looking back on it, but it is deliberately cryptic. Even after the resurrection, you remember the disciples they needed to have their minds supernaturally opened and enlightened to realize that Jesus did fulfill the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. And so I submit to you that the, the prophecies of Messiah in the Old Testament are deliberately cryptic, that it is calculated to be that way. Now, I've had you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And that's where we will go and spend the rest of our time. And I want to show you God's revelation. We just did a summation of a biblical worldview. We also just looked at uh, some deliberate misdirection that God has deliberately misdirected. He has cryptically kept uh, and calculated. He has planned his redemption plan has been designed to be deliberately misdirecting because I want you to see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, Paul is talking about the wisdom of God. He says, when I came to preach the gospel in Corinth, I didn't come using Greek philosophy and Greek wisdom. He said, I came presenting it with the wisdom of God. And he's making that uh, comparison and that contrast because he says in verse 5, I want your faith in Christ to not stand in the wisdom of men, not be human wisdom based, but rather in the power of God. And then look at this, beginning in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 2 down to verse 8. How be it, he said, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, that are complete, yet not the wisdom of this world nor the princes or the rulers of this world that come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Notice this eighth verse in particular. Wisdom which none of the princes or the rulers of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Do you understand what this is saying? That our God 
has deliberately made the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament cryptic until after they were fulfilled, the death and resurrection of our Savior, that God has designed his redemption plan to be deliberately misdirection. Because if the plan for Messiah's mission had been clear, the princes, and by the way, the word princes there in verse 8 is a word that refers to the hostile beings in the unseen realm who Paul calls the powers of darkness in Ephesians chapter uh, 1 and chapter 6, that these hostile beings in that unseen realm, if they knew that Messiah's mission, what it clearly was, they would have never killed Jesus. That's what verse 8 says. They would have never crucified Jesus because they would have known that if they crucified Jesus, he would rise again and uh, God's plan would be successful, and uh, they would be completed, uh, or, or rather defeated, that uh, God would reclaim the nations forever, and they would be totally defeated. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, after the fact, we are told that at Calvary, at the, uh, at the crucifixion of Jesus, that all these princes, all of these evil powers. They were stripped of their power, and they were paraded, so to speak, through the heavenlies. They were paraded as defeated foes. In other words, Jesus made fools out of his enemies. He totally cryptically misdirected them so they didn't understand the, mess the messianic plan of redemption so that he could secure the redemption of the human family that we, if we're believers, are part of. And in doing so, he was able to reclaim the nations from those gods, ultimately through his redemption from the Elohim, he's totally defeated them. So, some Asian, biblical worldview, at Babel, God uh, dispersed and disinherited the nations of this earth. And he placed their rulership in the hands of this council of gods, the Elohim. And they didn't do a good job. They rule corruptly. And God speaks judgment on them in Psalm chapter 82, the first eight verses. And so here in 1 Corinthians 2, we get the, a, a fuller picture that the plan of redemption was cryptic in the Old Testament but it was calculated to be that way so that God would deliberately misdirect them so that they wouldn't figure it out until after the fact that it was too late, that they crucified the Lord of glory. And in crucifying the Lord of glory, they ensured his resurrection and their defeat. One more point, and then we'll talk about this. In the remaining verses of the book of, of uh, 1 Corinthians 2, we have really a clear understanding of what revelation is. I'm not talking about the book of the Bible. I'm talking about divine revelation, which is what the Bible is as a whole. In fact, New Testament biblical truth is all revelation. Obviously, the Old Testament. We're talking about the New Testament. New Testament biblical truth is God's revelation. Look at verse 7. Paul says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world. This is eternal truth. Before the world, he ordained it unto our glory. Look at verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, every time I've ever heard a preacher mention that ninth verse, it was mentioned in the context of, well, you know, we'll, we can't even uh, imagine what heaven will hold for us. But what he is doing here, he's talking about the whole New Testament is a biblical mystery. You know what a mystery is in the Bible? 
The mystery is God's plan that was previously hidden from before the world began is finally unveiled. And if it's not unveiled, there is no creature that will ever discover it or ever figure it out. It would be totally clueless. I was reading in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, it says, the secret things belong unto God. There are things that God knows that we don't know, but there's things that we didn't know in the Old Testament times that we now see and know because God chose to reveal it in New Testament revelation. Biblical mysteries is what I'm talking about. And the meaning of that quote from Isaiah 64, 4 in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 2 is not talking about, um, it's not talking about specifically the, the Christian's future. It may include that, but it's talking about God's total plan of redemption. God's total plan of redemption. I have not seen, nor ear heard. Neither has it entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them. Look, we never figure it out. What, what we know about God's plan of redemption is what he has chosen to reveal to us in the New Testament scriptures. Otherwise, we'd be clueless. We'd have no clue. And so it's essential that we get revelation from God. It's essential that we know what the word of God says. Otherwise, we miss it. God has graciously chosen to put us at this time in this world with a New Testament, and we can understand truth that the ancients had no clue of because God hadn't revealed it then, but he's revealed it to us. To them, it was cryptic. To us, we understand it because it's after the fact. Now it can't be derailed by these the counsel of God's by these wicked spirit beings, Satan being the chief honcho there. I want you to look as we continue on, verse 10. Here's what he says about divine revelation, about this wonderful, remarkable, total plan of God's redemption. Verse 10, God hath revealed them unto us. How? By his spirit. You have the spirit of God. You have the ability to understand God's plan of redemption as revealed in the New Testament. He reveals it by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what knoweth the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? We relate to human things because we have a human spirit. The spirit of God knows the things of God because he is God. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, verse 11. Even so, the, the, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. In other words, you know the plan of redemption because the Spirit of God reveals it to you in the Scripture. Here's the point that he's making in these verses. God reveals biblical mystery to believers through your New Testament. God's messianic redemption plan that was previously secret is now supernaturally revealed to human to the human spirit in God's time and in God's way. The spirit of God ministers the truth through the New Testament to our human spirits and we understand what they never did. The Holy Spirit informs the way even that we speak, and even the words we use to share this wonderful truth. Look at what he says in the next verse. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us to God. In other words, what God reveals, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual. Simply, saying that uh, interpreting spiritual truths to spiritual minds, what he's saying is the Holy Spirit informs us as to the way we speak, even the words that we use to share this, that without divine revelation, we wouldn't have a clue. It's like this. You heard the saying, hindsight is twenty twenty. 
we New Testament believers have hindsight. And it's 2020 compared to what the Old Testament saints had. The New Testament is the Holy Spirit inspired Bible. And when that is illuminated by the Holy Spirit's anointing the reader, then you qualify as what verse 15 says, he that is spiritual. And verse 16 says, he that is spiritual has the mind or the thinking of Christ. He that is spiritual discerns all things, yet he himself is discerned of no man. Can't be figured out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. The spiritual man is the one who takes the spirit-inspired scripture and has a spirit-anointed, given understanding of that scripture. That's the spiritual man, and that's the mind of Christ that he's talking about here. 